to the passage that is found in the book of Acts concerning the deacon, Stephen, the deacon who graduated. Hallelujah. How many like to graduate? Most people stay in the same uh, grade for years and years and years. Somebody said, how do you figure that, Brother Freddie? Well, because to graduate, you have to take a test and pass it. How many ever went from the third to the fourth grade? Let's see your hands. How'd you ever do it? You passed your test. That's how you did it. Most people get tested by the same old test and they flunk every day. Hello. Every day they're flying off the handle. Every day they're having a temper tantrum. Can't seem to whip it. Every day they're cussing up a storm. Every day they're still smoking that cigarette. Drinking that whiskey bottle. I mean, they're tested on it every time they turn around, and every time they get the test, they flunk it again, and they never have made it to the fourth grade yet. Don't you want to graduate tonight? Stephen was a deacon who graduated, and I want to show you tonight by scripture that you can elevate yourself to, not you, but God can do it for you, but you can attain and you can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Nothing is more important in this service tonight than the preaching of God's word. Everything that's happened up until now is on credit that we preach it. Everything that will transpire upon its conclusion is in confirmation to the preached word of God. Stephen was a deacon who graduated, and as we look at it here, Acts chapter 6, first three verses would be a good place to start. Acts 6, verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Hmm. Hmm. Sectarianism here, huh? Uh, divided. They had a little split. The Greeks and the Jews. Aren't you glad that the middle wall partition has been knocked down? There's now no difference between Jew and a Greek. But the same Lord over all is rich unto all who will call upon the name of the Lord. And whosoever shall call shall be saved. But there rose a murmuring because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom ye or we may appoint over this business. But we'll give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Uh, verse 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 15, all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Chapter 7, verse 55, Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, verse 60, and he kneeled down and cried of a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Glory be to God. Lord, we thank you tonight for the reading of this word. Let it be rich and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierced now to the dividing asunder, soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and let it be a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of every heart tonight. I thank you for victory and for the answers that are arriving. And everyone said amen. Wave the wave offering one more time. Clear the atmosphere above your head. You may have to touch the throne of God at any moment now. And when it comes time for you to do so, then come boldly onto the throne of grace that you might find grace to help in time of need and that you may obtain mercy. Now Stephen was a deacon who graduated. There was a problem going on because the disciples were multiplying, kind of like they are around here every night. And how many newcomers do we have again tonight? Let's see your hand. If you're brand new, this is the first time you've been here. Amen. Well, that's about a third. Now, every night the crowd is increasing. We started off here about 50 people on the first night, and it's just been growing. 
But you see, when the disciples start to multiply, and a disciple is a follower of Christ, Christian means Christ-like, and church means, by definition, the called out ones. Wondering why the preacher bends his ear, he listens for a response, amen, oh me, or oh my, one of them will fit you. The microphone is rather portable. We can pick out the quiet spot and come down there and preach tonight. There is no cord on this microphone, which means there's nobody in the tent that can escape us this evening. Or in the parking lot either. Hallelujah. We could go to town and preach and you'd hear us back here because we're on the air. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, thank God. Things are increasing tonight. Aren't you glad? Glory to the Lord. Now, when the, the disciples are increasing, and of course the word church means the called out ones, someone said, I don't know if I want to go down to the revival meeting because the preacher might call me out. Hey, you get called out tonight. You counted a big fat compliment. The word church means the called out ones. You might just belong to the church after all. Somebody said, which church is that, Brother Freddie? Well, if you be quiet, I'll tell you. You really want to know? How many would really like to know? Okay, you asked for it. It's the church of the General Assembly of the Firstborn, whose names are written in heaven unto an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of just men already made perfect. Hallelujah. I want to belong to that one. Hallelujah. So tonight, if you get called out, you just jump for joy. If you don't have joy, you try jumping for joy. Hallelujah. And here is disciples, church members, Christians, multiplying. And of course, as they multiply, so do the problems. And so do the murmurings. Do you know that there were more people that died with Moses in the wilderness by murmuring and complaining than for any other reason? Hmm. We can't stand this angel food. Hmm. Why do all we have to eat every day is manna, manna, manna? Oh, that we could go back to the leeks and the onions and the garlics and die in Egypt's sand. You need not look for me down in Egypt's sand, for I have pitched my tent far up in Beulah land. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Somebody murmured and said, this water's bitter. Well, what do you expect, said Moses? You've been bitter for three days. Say amen. We can't drink it. God can't put up with your attitude and your spirit for the past uh, 72 hours either. Say amen. And so what you're drinking out of the bitter waters of Mera is nothing but a reflection of your own nature for the past three days, and now it's good enough for you. Well, they were talking about having a necktie party. That is, they were going to lynch Moses. However, he prayed, and God showed him a certain tree. And he put the tree into the waters and healed the bitter waters. And if you'll pray tonight, God will give you a revelation of a certain tree that'll take every bit of bitterness out of your craw and out of your spirit and out of your nature and sweeten you up after all these days of being unable to live with you. Hallelujah. Anybody know the certain tree I'm talking about? Not any tree will do. Only a certain tree will do. And it's called Calvary's tree. And cursed be every man that hangs upon a tree. But thank God he became a curse for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. He's redeemed us from the curse of the law tonight. Thank God. Oh, yes. Yeah, they murmured, complained. Are you the only one God can use around here, Moses? Well, if Aaron hadn't been high priest, he'd have been slapped with leprosy, so his sister got it. Miriam got leprosy and was put outside the gate for three whole days. She held up progress, and the camp couldn't move. People couldn't budge. Nobody could go on with God. The tabernacle couldn't uh, continue. Be careful about your murmuring. You're going to hold up progress. You're going to stop the rest of us. Listen, I don't want to be outside the camp. Jesus himself suffered without the gate for three days. So poor old Miriam could be free of her leprosy and everyone else could be loose from their spots of sin. Say praise alone. Oh, it's the truth tonight that murmuring caused their bones to bleach in the desert sun. We can't go up and possess the country. Why, the giants are so big, and the cities are so walled, and the valleys are so deep, and the mountains are so high, and the obstacles are so great. 
Well, isn't it a wonderful land? Of course, it's milk and honey flow and grapes of Esco grow. The whole land is filled with fruits, fruits of the Spirit in your Christian conquest. Someone said, I'm going to Canaan's land because that's heaven. No, it's not heaven yet, brother. There's too many obstacles, but after Canaan's land, you come out of the wilderness and go into Canaan's land, then the next jumping off place will be heaven for you. Someone said, isn't the land free? Oh, it's a gift. Wherever your soul of your foot trods, God will give it to you. If you go in there and be man enough to claim it. There are gifts of the Spirit in the land of your Christian endeavor. There are fruits of the Spirit in the land of Christian life and conquest. But you've got to be man enough to go after it. You've got to dare to believe God. You've got to have a backbone and not a wishbone. A turtle never goes no place until he sticks his neck out. Stick your neck out and go somewhere, no matter how slow, or crawl back in your shell. And if you have to crawl back in your shell tonight, you better pray your hard shell. Because if you get in the way and get run over, the shell's going to stand the strain of the crack. Say amen. Oh, let us get out of the way and let God have his way. What do you say here tonight? Oh, blessed be God, I'm happy. Do you love his word? I feel like I'm going to have a treat here tonight. I just feel almost like I'm sinking my teeth into something exquisite and exotic. How many wants a royal dainty? Smack your lips and taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. It tastes just like honey in the rock. Ah, glory. Well, be that as it may, murmuring has got to quit. Complaining has got to go. Fault finding has got to leave up the chimney sweep. Hallelujah. They died in the wilderness by the tens of thousands because of murmuring and complaining. Hallelujah. Complained about the food, complained about the water, complained about the way, complained about the leadership. Every time God judged them with divine judgment, they complained about that. So there's lots of murmurings can come on when the disciples are multiplied. And this particular rift came between the Jews and the Greeks, and we've already ascertained there's no difference between a Jew and a Greek, not on this side of the cross. Hallelujah. You're just a wild olive branch been grafted in. That's all you are. Don't get heady and high-minded. If God does, didn't spare the natural branches, the Jewish nation, and put blindness in part upon their eyes and remove them, how would the Gentiles have been grafted in? You don't even belong in there, but God's put you there. You better walk softly. Say hallelujah. Is it the truth tonight? Oh, blessed be God for his word. Now, the Jews and the Greeks, they had this uh, argument and this little murmuring and division and rift and uh, split in the congregation. How many have ever been in a congregational split? I've preached to a lots of them, and every time I go to one, I can always tell if I'm in a split because folks on this side got brand new rakes and wore out pitchforks. Folks on this side has got wore out pitchforks and brand new rakes. And the more I, the preacher preaches right down the middle, right through the center of the split, here's all these folks just wearing out their pitchforks. Oh, preach it, Brother Freddie, preach it. They sure do need it. They don't have time to hit the ground on this side before the folks on the other side with their wore out pitchforks catches it in midair. They pitch it back over to the other side. And I've never seen none of them yet start raking it home. The paint is still on scratched on their brand new rakes. Say praise the Lord. Well, you can clap or you don't have to clap. It's the truth anyhow. Hallelujah. Well, I'm feeling fine. Yes, finally she came. It was a snowy night. There was nobody there in the congregation that night but her. And the preacher said, boy, I got her now. And didn't he lay the whole load on her? And didn't he zero in on her shenanigans? And didn't he pin her hide to the wall? And didn't he lay the word of God right down where she was living until she should have been squirming? He said, boys, there's no way that she can avoid getting the brunt of this because she's the only one here in the meeting. Well, after church, here she came up to the front and said, Oh, preacher, she said, what a wonderful message. If they had only been here tonight, they would have gotten it. 
Hallelujah. Now you're listening. Praise my God. I'm getting happy. Now well, here he is, uh, Stephen, uh, a deacon who graduated. And finally, the division that came had to do with this particular problem, that the widows were being neglected in the daily ministration. Listen, if you're a widow tonight, I'm not talking to you in the natural. I am talking to spiritual widows tonight. Hello. The Bible says he or she that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Don't you have a maker? The Bible said thy maker is thy husband. The Bible says that. Hallelujah. We are workers together with Christ. They that are joined unto the Lord shall be fruitful and productive in the spirit. Thank God. And it's absolutely true tonight that Christ is the bridegroom. It's act, act, absolutely true tonight that Christ is the head of the church and the church is the bride. Say amen. Are you the bride or are you a widow? Have you been uh, disassociated? There's no way that uh, you could lose the Lord Jesus and become loosed. There's no way that you could separate and uh, be still alive and God be dead. The only thing that can separate you from him is your sins. Thy iniquities have separated you from me, said the Lord. Now, we do have a husbandman who is first partaker of the fruit. We have the head of the body. We have the bridegroom. We have Christ who is the head like the, the man is the head of the woman, the scripture says. Now, this is very true that the widow was not necessarily necessary to be in the stage and state of a widow and she was neglected someone said I don't I don't believe I'm a spiritual widow well are you neglected if you're neglected and you don't have your needs met and you're starving and you're hungry and you don't uh, you're not being took care of it's probably because you asked not you've been separated from your provider from the one who was promised to take care of you come the devil or the deep blue sea the one who told you that the lilies don't torn or spin and they don't have a nervous breakdown and Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of them and wouldn't God put some glory in your soul tonight if we put that kind of glory that Solomon didn't have in a lily? You have not because you ask not. Ask, receive, seek, find, knock, it shall be open unto you. If you're going to ask, ask largely, James said, that your joy might be filled. Quit asking for a margin to barely skinch by. Ask for a margin for operation and get happy about it and get over your mule face religion. There's no need with Christ as alive as he is that you and I should be dead to our partner, separated from our husband, say amen, divided from our provider, say hallelujah and if we are neglected and if we are in want and not provided for it's because we don't know who we are let's get back into the body because the body is his bride it is the church if you please say amen Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and he, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word God's word has given you a bath tonight the church is his bride. Let's not be a widow. What do you say? Now, if uh, you are a widow, let's do something about it. How do I know if I'm a widow? You're neglected. Uh, you're not being taken care of. You're not provided for. And the daily administration is kept from you. Now, I believe there's a daily administration of the Spirit. The Bible tells us that God added to the church daily such that should be saved. And whether you're a man or a woman, you might just as, you could be called a widower just as easy as you could be called a widow. And what I'm speaking of here tonight, spiritually speaking. Because there is every day an, a ministry that needs to go forth. The administration of the Holy Ghost. The scripture says that there is one God but differences of gifts. There is one Holy Ghost but differences of administrations. There is one Lord but there is differences of gifts. What that means is there is a different gift, a different ministry, and a different operation of both gift and ministry. Not everybody's going to operate like you. 
but thank God for a ministry that's real and thank God for a gift that's real. No matter how it operates, say hallelujah. Isn't that right? There's a daily administration that the widow's not getting in on. And if you're not getting in on the daily Holy Ghost ministry and administration of the gift and the operation of the Spirit of God, then you've been severed and separated and you're missing out on something that's going to cause strife and division and separation. We're going to have uh, problems among the disciples. We're going to have division even among the churches. We're going to have separations and as the disciples multiply, too much murmuring going on and that's how you drop dead in the wilderness, by murmuring and complaining. More people died of murmuring than for any other thing that happened in the wilderness. Then they murmured and said, can't God prepare a table in the wilderness? Why, he'd been preparing it for 40 years and some dud come along and said, well, I know God's done it for 40 straight years, morning, noon, and night, but can God still do it? I'm here to tell you tonight, God can still do it, just like he did last night, like he did last year, like he did 2,000 years ago, from the beginning of time. In fact, the Bible says we get a better thing today than the poor old prophets had back then. They desired to look into the things which we see and could not see them. Many noble, mighty men after the flesh have desired to look into it. God, having prepared some better thing for you and I, that they, those Old Testament saints, without us, could not be made perfect. You have the responsibility on your shoulder tonight to make the Old Testament saints perfect by this entering of a better thing, the daily administration, the fullness of the Holy Ghost and the gospel and the cross and knowing the end from the beginning like we do today, enough gospel to save the world and we don't even witness to the neighbor. Say hallelujah. How many knows this is the truth? Thank God for truth. One thing about truth it will set you free. The native impressive truth has such a ring and a stamp to it that you can't escape it. And you know when it's got you cornered. Hallelujah. I love him. And so now, uh, the widows have this uh, daily administration problem, or the lack of it. And it begins to bother the apostles, and they get together and says, It's not me that we should wait on tables and serve tables and stop waiting on God. We're not going to stop waiting on God to go wait on tables. Now there is the priesthood, and there is the ministry, and there are those who are called to do the work of the tabernacle. We know that. And it's also true, it is also true that even though you work at some secular job or some other task and you have your particular vocation or trade, amen, still there comes a time in your life that is God's first, the tithing of your time, the tithing of your energy, the tithing of your strength, the tithing of your worship, giving God the better portion, the first portion. And then he gives you so many more portions you don't know, know what to do with them all. Hallelujah. Thank God. And there comes a time in everybody's life when they need to wait on God. Hallelujah. We cannot quit waiting on God and start waiting on tables, said Peter. We've got to stay ahead of what God is doing. And help the people to get farther into God than they've been before. Amen. So you see, uh, when they picked out seven deacons, then they continuously served God in prayer and in the Word. And I believe that even before you do your job, no matter what your job is every day, you better spend some time in prayer and spend some time in the Word. And if you will, you'll get your head screwed on straight. If you will, you'll be able to think and schedule yourself. If you will, you'll be able to departmentalize. You won't be walking around in a fog with your chicken, like a chicken of his head cut off. What, what's wrong? What, what's right? What should I be doing? What should I not be doing? Do I have any direction at all? No direction until you spend time in prayer and spend time in the Word. I have many times told the boys on this team, the easiest way in the world to backslide is on an evangelistic team or at a Bible college. What do you mean, Brother Freddie? Why, in Bible college, they study the Bible every day. In a revival, they see miracles every night. I don't mean nothing. Don't mean a thing. Miracles and study uh, on its own and just be being a student and a scribe of the Word is not necessarily ever going to make you spiritual. Nothing can make you spiritual. Thirteen corpses raising from the dead here tonight would not make you spiritual. 
The only way you're going to stay spiritual, and never forget this, is you've got to work on yourself. You've got to make yourself spiritual. You've got to read. You've got to study. You've got to pray. You've got to walk in the Spirit. You have got to resist the devil. You have got to overcome. You've got to do it. Last night, if you've been here, you'd learn the, the message on the law of sin, how you've got to get it out of the flesh, because Paul said, of my flesh, I serve sin, and I don't want to do it. It's overpowering me. I can't help it. I'm bound. I can't, I, I can't control it. What am I going to do? Only the Lord Jesus Christ can give us deliverance over the law of sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. No matter what happens, don't let the cares of life or interruptions or confusions hinder you or rob you from knowing, thus saith the Lord, your manna for the evening, or you'll just be a spiritual runt until you die, just in the way, taking up space and useless. Dead weight, unable to be toted. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to spend time in prayer. I want to spend time in the Word. And then when I wait on tables or whatever else I do, I'll have direction. I'll be ahead of the game. I'll be able to do so much more in such a less amount of time. Isn't that right? Oh, don't you want to float on a cloud all day? Wouldn't you like to have the 20 tons of bricks lifted off in you? Wouldn't you like to have a clear head and not be confused until you don't know if you're putting square pegs in round holes or not? Say amen. So here's what's happened. And so Peter and the Disciples decide they're going to wait on God and they're going to pick deacons to wait on tables and so we see the job of the deacons. I said now we're beginning to learn what the deacon's job really is. To wait on tables and take care of these little murmurings and complainings and well you don't always have to stay a deacon but you must have the right qualifications to even be a deacon. Yet you can graduate and grow deeper in God as you go. Let's see what God's put in the church. First Come on, you Bible students. God hath put in the church first. What? Apostles. Secondarily. Prophets. Thirdly. Evangelists. Fourthly. Pastors. Fifthly. Teachers. Sixthly, in another verse in Ephesians. Miracles. Healings. Helps. Governments. Diversities of tongues. How many have we got so far? About ten. All right, after that, I know that there are listed in the church bishops, elders, deacons, uh, board members, members not quite so bored. Amen. Servants, uh, elders, uh, brethren, sister. God's put a lot of things in the church. He must have. Turn around, look who's here. God's not fussy who he puts in the church. If you're washed in the blood, that's all it's going to take for a first step. And he's not fussy who he uses. Just show up for work and punch the clock. I believe God will use you if you let him. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Now let us see. This deacon, I don't know where the deacon was. He's down there somewhere. So, oh yeah, I don't, don't want to forget superintendents and general superintendents and overseers and general overseers. They're all down that list somewhere, down along the ladder, but anyhow, hello. <laughs> now they begin to decide what kind of a caliber person ought to be selected to do the job of a deacon. Now, first of all, the Lord spoke and said they're going to be full of the Holy Ghost. And we're going to look at the baptism here in just a minute. <coughs> we know that we must be baptized in water. <coughs> we must also be filled with the Spirit. Baptized in Spirit. Amen. Now, who we're going to select, and they selected seven of them, and one of them, Stephen, excelled above them all and received seven baptisms. So, so oh, there's no more baptism than water and Spirit. That's it, Brother Freddie. Well, don't be too sure yet until we're finished tonight, and then we'll find out how many baptisms that Stephen had. Okay, you want to check into it and study it? All right, first of all, they must be a man full of the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's full of the Holy Ghost. That fullness means baptism. Baptism means fullness. Uh, immersed, plunged, dunked, buried, placed beneath the flow with all my billows over me, filling my cup and saucer too, reaching even the pivot point, flowing out my mouth. 
There in John chapter 4, he said, The Spirit of God shall be in you a well of living water, woman of Samaria. Spring it out. But by the time he wrote John chapter 7, John was able to say, Jesus is quoting, Now rivers are flowing out. Amen? Woman, I'll put a new well in you. It'll be a well of living water springing up unto life eternal. But in John chapter 7, the last day, the great day, the feast, he stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and out of his belly shall flow ri rivers, rivers of living water. How many has got a well? That's for you. How many has got rivers? That's for other folks because it's flowing out in nine separate directions, which are nine gifts of the Spirit. You believe there's nine rivers of flowing? How many is flowing out of you? One sister come up to old brother Freddy. Tongues is the least of the gifts. I said, you ought to at least have the least of the gifts. But why if I didn't have the least of something, the, the least of the least of something, I wouldn't have a whole lot of nothing. Amen. Of course, tongues as a gift is a message to the church, and it must be interpreted. Tongues as an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for three reasons. He that speaks of an unknown tongue speaks of unto God. 1 Corinthians 14, I'm quoting here. I can't talk to you all the time. I have to talk to God once in a while. Or I'd have nothing to say to you. Number one, he that speaketh of an unknown tongue, speaketh unto God. Number two, he that speaketh of an unknown tongue, edifieth himself. Amen. You're not supposed to edify yourself, Brother Freddie. I beg your pardon, but you better, or you'll lose the faith. If there be any virtue, there be anything of a good report, anything honest or good, think on those things. David said, I will encourage myself in the Lord. You must build yourself up in the most holy faith. But number three, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speak of mysteries. For there's no man, beast, nor demon understands the word he's saying. I have a way to pray that bypasses every interception that hell could send my way. Oh, I can pray in another tongue or another language, and I, I got a clear channel clean on through to heaven. Say praise the Lord. But now, let's get to the gifts of the Spirit. The, the One of the nine gifts called the gift of tongues is not me speaking to God, but speaking to men, speaking to congregations. And this is why Paul said, I'd rather speak 10,000 words uh, uh, ten words of my own understanding than ten thousand in an unknown tongue. Yes, when I'm speaking to the congregation. There's always two categories that Paul refers to. God and the people. Bringing God to the people, bringing the people to God. Of course, if it's a message to you, I'm a barbarian to you if it's not interpreted. Absolutely. Hallelujah. And in fact, it has to be interpreted or hold your peace. Some say, oh, I can't hold it back. The Bible said the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophets. You can so hold it back. Say amen. And if there's no interpreter, pray that you interpret. And if you don't plan on interpreting, well, then just hush. That's what Paul said. But then tongues is the least of the gifts, and that being a gift to the congregation that must be interpreted. But there's something beyond that. Prophecy takes the place of tongues plus interpretation and eliminates the necessity of even having the message in tongues when you prophesy and you do it in the language that you speak and understand and it comes directly in your language. History written in, in advance, that's prophecy. Or it might be a word fitly spoken, like apples of gold and baskets of silver. It might be just the thing somebody needed at the time, although a prophet in the Old Testament may have already prophesied it and you're just reiterating and repeating it. It might be like a heavily anointed exhortation but thank God for the gifts of the Spirit anyhow Stephen could not have even been a deacon unless he'd been filled with the Holy Ghost now listen I don't care if you're the garbage collector you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost I don't care if you're a dishwasher you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost well, my position in life that's not important you want to really please God without faith it's impossible to please him and when Jesus was in Jordan and the Holy Spirit in a symbolical bodily shape of a dove descended upon him, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit of God, he was baptized, not only in water, but in spirit while yet in the river. Hallelujah. Now he was born of the Holy Ghost, we know that. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. But though Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost and God was his Father, yet the Holy Spirit fell upon him at water baptism. And the voice said, I'm well pleased. I'm really pleased to see him filled with the Holy Spirit. And God wants you full of the Holy Ghost, and that will please him tonight. Say amen. Someone said, well, I, I, I just wait on tables. Well, 
you still need the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I'm just a painter. I'm a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. Who cares? God wants you full of the Holy Ghost. Even though a deacon is a menial, natural task of a job to do in a church, you still need to be full. And fullness means the baptism. Woo, go away. Don't you want full control? Did you know that when God's got your tongue, he's got all of you? I repeat, when God's got your tongue, he's got all of you. Why? Because the tongue is what? The last unruly member to control in the body. You can control your whole body and you can't control your tongue. And yet it's so powerful that in it, James said, is the power of death and life. Hang that man. Set that man free. See how powerful the word is? And the word comes from the tongue. And I'll tell God's got your tongue, he hasn't got you under control. Of course, I knew a little sister that hair, had hair down to here, sleeves down to here, a hemline down to here, and a tongue clear down to here. Hallelujah. And she spoke in tongues on Sunday, but uh, gossiped the rest of the week. I'm wondering if her tongue was really controlled by the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing me? Uh, someone said, well, you're on that subject again. Yeah, I'm on the least of the gifts. Why don't you start off with the least and maybe you'll get some more. Say praise the Lord. Are you hearing me tonight? Thank the Lord. So, the tongue is a deadly evil that no man can tame. It's a rudder that guides the boat. It's a bridle that steers the horse. But it's a deadly fire out of control. But what man cannot control or tame, don't you believe God can? God can always do what man cannot. And since God is a spirit, why don't you let God, who is a spirit, the greatest revelation in the Bible, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why don't you let that spirit of God take control of your tongue? And once he's got your tongue, he's got the last member of your body, thus he's got your whole body under control. Now, how do I know if he's got my tongue? Well, by the fruits, of course, and by the gifts, of course. There are two realms, two worlds. There's the flesh and the soul. There is the natural world. There's the supernatural world. And although... I may not gossip, and I may have my tongue bridled and under control. I must also have something spiritual coming out of it. And the apostles looked for a language that uh, was spoken, the tongue of men and angels, something never learned in a university, never learned in a college. And when they heard them speak of tongues, they knew that they were totally filled, and the whole body was under control of the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to stay under control, but in as much as you stay filled with the Spirit, you will remain under control. Say hallelujah. Everything God ever give is instant and progressive. Remember the night you got saved? Was it instant? Was it definite? And did you have to keep it? Remember the night you got healed? Did it really happen? Did you have to also keep it? Uh-oh, you had to keep it, did you? It must be progressive too. Even in the gifts of the Spirit, there's miracles, the instant work of God. Then there's healing, the gradual and progressive restoration of God. You see that? Cut your finger, three weeks it'll heal up. However, if you cut your finger and God heals it, it might heal in three days. It's a whole lot faster when the gift hits it. Say praise the Lord. Are you listening close? I'd rather take some time than never get it. Most people got two minutes, God. Can you bless me in two minutes? I, I, I don't have time for nothing but a miracle. Hurry up, preacher, and do whatever you're going to do to get me out of this chair. I got a heavy schedule. Well, God might be wanting to work a process in your life. I can't make him do anything. I'm just thankful he does anything. I just want to get out of the way and see what he does want to do. Hello? Is this too practical? Or should I just speak in innuendo and go over your head so you couldn't understand and preach the gospel in flowery words and eloquency of speech? Or did, would you rather us preach it in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost? That was Paul's gospel. He said, I don't preach it no other way. He said, if an angel from heaven comes down and preaches it different, let him be cursed. He said, if I come next year preaching a different gospel than I preach last year, don't you listen to me neither. That's what Paul said. He said that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but stand in the power of God. Hallelujah. Brother, this didn't have any power to it. I'd quit it. If this wasn't real, I'd find something else that was real. I wouldn't preach healing if folks weren't getting healed. I wouldn't preach salvation if they weren't getting saved. I wouldn't preach the Holy Ghost if they weren't speaking in tongues. I wouldn't preach sanctification if all I saw was sanctification. Say amen. 
full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. Now, I know that we must be spirit-filled first to have all the rest of God's best. There are people t trying to operate gifts of the Spirit that's not even filled with the Spirit yet. Hello, that's heavy. So, so when they're having success, they're having just as much success as in direct proportion they are filled. Chew on that a minute. If you're in Ezekiel's river to your knees, that's just about how effective your gift is going to be. Knee deep. But if you want 100% effectiveness, then get out in Ezekiel's river to where it's over your head and there's waters to swim in. As long as I'm touching the bottom, I won't learn to swim. I'll be fishing for it. But when it's up here, glub, 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 I'm going to drown or learn to swim. Brother, I'm either going back to the shore or learn to swim. Someone said, that's the problem of your preaching, Brother Freddie. It's way over my head. Well, thank God it's over your head because that way you'll learn to swim. Hallelujah. Launch out into the deep and let the shoreline go tonight. Thank God forever. Woo. Why don't you cast yourself on the mercies of God and launch out into the deep and get out to a place that's, that you're not doing it no more. God's doing it for you and you're swimming. You're not fishing for the bottom to walk on the bottom. Brother, something is boring you up supernaturally. It's about like learning to fly. I might not be able to fly yet, but I've learned how to swim. But wait till you see me in my new body. It'll fly. It'll fly. Hallelujah. Aren't you happy? Follow the Holy Ghost. Now, the seven spirits of God. you believe that the Bible talks about the seven spirits of God? In the book of Revelations, three times, in the voice of three witnesses, every word should be established. These things saith he who hath the seven spirits of God. Secondly, a voice said, come up higher, and John went through a door in heaven and found himself before the throne of God, and before the throne were seven lamps burning, which are the seven spirits of God. Thirdly, come see the lion of the tribe of Judah that prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. Oh, said John, where is he? He's behind you. And he looked, and behold, a lamb, as it were slain from the foundation of the world, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, some people wonder, did God have seven spirits? No, one spirit. Now, remember this. One spirit, but diversities of operation. Differences of ministration. Differences of gifts. Hello. There's only one place in the Bible the seven spirits of God are mentioned, and that's in Isaiah 11, chap uh, chapter 11, verse 2 and 3. But a branch shall come forth out of the root of Jesse, and a stem or root shall come forth out of his root. And the Spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. Of course, it's referring to who? To, to Jesus Christ when he's born, because Isaiah could have wrote the gospel. You could write the gospel according to Isaiah just by reading the book of Isaiah, the, the number one major Old Testament prophet, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord shall be upon him. The Spirit of wisdom, there's two. The Spirit of understanding, three. The Spirit of counsel, four. The Spirit of might, five. The Spirit of of knowledge, six, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. I point that out because it's the spirit of the Lord first. All things that you successfully perform are the direct result of being filled with the spirit. Then you have wisdom, not man's wisdom and earthly wisdom, which is sensual, but God's wisdom. Oh, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that waveth is like the wave of the sea driven with the wind and toss. Understanding? Hmm. Wisdom, you might do something that's wise, but you may not understand why you did it. Let's get some understanding, too. And then counsel. I'm not talking about free advice, opinion, somebody's idea, philosophy, or ideology. Holy Ghost counsel. The kind of direction that is profitable and successful. And might, well, that's the power department. And knowledge, that's the revelation having it revealed, and the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. And I say tonight that Stephen graduated because he was filled with the Holy Ghost, his first baptism, and full of wisdom, his second baptism. How many wants to be wise? And all thy getting, get wisdom. Hallelujah. We've already mentioned, you can have wisdom by asking for it. Then in the, Father in the chapter, it said he was full of faith. There's the third baptism, the fullness of faith. How am I not to be filled with faith tonight? Remember Ezekiel's river. 
Some people are operating at half mast, waist deep in the river. Get full. When you're full, you'll hit the overflow. You'll find it easy to pray and to shout all the day when your cup's running over with joy. Hallelujah. Don't you want to get full and bubbling and running over? Oh, hallelujah. Full of faith. Well, there's different kinds of faith. You flip a switch, you believe the light's going to come on, and sure enough, it does. Unless the light's blown. You turn the key and you believe the car's going to crank, and it does. Unless the starter's gone. You come to an altar and repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that saving faith and it saves you. First step, repentance. Oh, there's lots of steps to heaven, but got to start someplace. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Some say, well, they're not ready yet. They need to be baptized, filled with the Holy Ghost, sanctified. On, 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 on. Anything that don't grow will die. The grass don't grow, it'll die. Your body don't grow, it'll die. First it'll be runted, then it'll be stunted, then it'll be dead. Someone said, I'm growing old, Brother Freddy. Well, at least you're growing. I said, at least you're growing. If you weren't growing old, you'd be already a corpse and we'd had preached your funeral. Say amen. Are uh, you glad? Woo, hallelujah, I love him. Full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, and full of faith. The third baptism that Stephen had. Oh, I'm talking about qualifications for a deacon. How much more should you persevere and dig in there and find a higher place in God than you've ever been in before? Some say, well, I'm not called to be a deacon. You should be called to be more than a deacon. A deacon just serves tables. Takes care of these widows that got separated from their provider. Say amen. Does natural and menial tasks mundane jobs hello don't you want to do something more than just do a natural waiting on table scenario well then get full of the holy ghost because this was the reason that stephen started climbing jacob's ladder and going deeper in god than ever before he was full of the holy ghost and full of wisdom and now full of faith now someone said i have faith yes natural faith saving faith how about the gift of faith that's god's faith it's one of the nine gifts of the spirit Faith is also a fruit of the Spirit. Am I right? A gift and a fruit, both. So tonight I'm looking for faith. The fullness of faith. Not just the gift of faith, which is not mine, but God's faith. My faith don't work too good sometimes, but he takes over and I can believe God for anything. That's a gift. But I'm talking about the fullness of faith. Faith, fullness. Have you caught on yet? What is faith, fullness, or the fullness of faith? Faithfulness is what? Faithfulness. Got you, didn't I? The baptism of faith is faithfulness. Fullness of faith is faithfulness. You got it? Some say, what you talking about? I'm talking about you consistently the same every time I see you. Dependable. We can count on you. You're not up one day and down the next, tossed to and fro by every wind. The doctrine, wandering stars carried about of a tempest whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever for. Every time we see you, you're faithful. You've been baptized in faith. Some say, oh, there's no more baptisms than water and spirit. Oh. He was full of wisdom. And it was full of faith. When you get full and overflow, brother, you've been baptized in whatever that thing is. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how am I straightened until it be accomplished? Hallelujah. He said, I wish this cup would pass for me. It's going to overwhelm me. It's going to take me over. I'm going to go all the way to Calvary. And brother, he went all the way. And he was baptized with that baptism. Thank God. Oh, glory to God. All right, full of power. How many like to be filled with power? The baptism of power. Some folks have got enough power to take care of headaches and toe aches. Hello. Are you listening? Some people seem to have power today and gone tomorrow. Hello. I'm talking about the fullness, 100% effectiveness because you're in the river over your head. Full of power. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, it's a full. It just busts out the seams and you try to hold it back, you'll blow a gasket. Say amen. Here is old Stephen. He's graduating. He's not just going to be waiting on tables and collecting the garbage and 
running errands on the pickup truck. He's not going to be a yes ma'am. He's just not going to be another uh, hand. He's not going to be a, a, a ditch digger always. He's growing in the spirit. He's going to attain something in God he's never been before. And he had to start somewhere, so he got full of the Holy Ghost. He got full of wisdom. He got full of faith, and he got full of power. Now he was doing mighty signs and wonders in the name of Jesus because he was full of power. Amen. And then, of course, the devil got mad because he always gets upset when you start upsetting him. Hello? Is it true? Do you realize tonight that the devil never bothers nobody that's not bothering him? And if you've not had the devil after you this week, you better check inventory and find out what's wrong with you. Say, hey, mate, how much had the devil after you this week? Lord, i got to get out and pray that he gets after you. Uh, at least I'll know whose camp you're in. Because as long as he's after you, he hasn't got you. Your hand must still be in it. Jesus' hand. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Oh, glory, I love him. Now, the devil's upset, and he brings all the religious folks down Stephen's neck. Breathe and fire down his neck. Jumping down his throat and teetering on his windpipe. And while they asked him to come up and give an account of himself, Lord of mercy, didn't he ever preach a sermon? He preached the sermon entitled, You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and in ears, you always do resist the Holy Ghost. What a sermon to preach religious Pharisees and Sadducees. But he preached it. He started back there in Genesis and showed how every time God wanted to do something, God's man, God's people got in the way of God trying to do it. Abraham said, move out, quit serving the moon God and start serving the God that made the moon. His daddy said, I'm not going no farther than this. We're staying here. And Abraham was held up until God killed his daddy. Amen. And Terah, who was a holy terror, was buried in Haran. I suppose that's where we get Terran. It's the same town that uh, he was buried in. So now Abraham was free to get up and go on again. And then, of course, Isaac uh, got mixed up. And Jacob got supplanter, uh, became a supplanter. And Joseph couldn't figure out which son ought to be blessed. And uh, they resisted Moses. And uh, God sent Moses to deliver him. They didn't even recognize it. And finally, God sent Moses back. The same people that, that rejected him had to take Moses as a deliverer. 40 years later, held up progress for 40 years. Why, Solomon tried to build him a house. How be it the most time dwelleth not? And temples made by hands. Saul became a king when God was their king. Lord, said Stephen, you people have always, as your fathers did, so do you, always resist the plan of God and the mind of God and the will of God. Always getting it confused and mixed up. and They couldn't take that. They gnashed their teeth, and while he was preaching, it looked like a 200-watt light bulb came on his face. His face began to shine like an angel. Why? Because he was full, full of light. Don't you want to get baptized in light tonight? Oh, I'm looking for the light. I want to walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship one of another in the blood of Jesus Christ who cleansed me from all sin. Thank God. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If you say you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, you lie and do not the truth. Hallelujah. But if you walk in the light as he is in it, you have fellowship one of another. So much fellowship you can't stand it all. Fellowship is two fellows on the same ship. Put everybody in the same boat. Everybody in the same boat paddling in the same direction, that is. That's fellowship. You know, if you could get enough light in here, you'd see the angels. If you could get a light beyond the light of day, you could see the supernatural realm. Light reveals things. If your eye is single, your body is full of light. If your eye is evil, your body is full of darkness. Brother, thy word is a light to my path and a lamp unto my feet. Thank God for light. I want to get so full of light tonight that I'll see every supernatural thing I need to see and I will be baptized in light. Hallelujah. Some of I've never heard kind of preaching like that before. Well, it's laid in Acts chapter 6 and 7. Oh, while his face shone, they picked up stones to stone him. While he was shining like an angel. Isn't that just the way of people? They're so jealous. They're so scared that you're going to get ahead of them. 
you suppose they got something I don't have? I'll have to knock it in the head to level off the difference between us. I'll have to have nothing but bad to say about it, because after all, if it's true, I'll have to seek God and get it too. And I don't know if I have time to do that. I've got so much time to spend on the golf course and so many time, so much time to run here, there, and run around circles like a dog chasing his tail, getting nowhere. Say amen. One preacher told me one time, I said, Oh, Brother Freddie, we can't back you this year. I said, Why not? He said, Why? I said, Wasn't it God? Oh, it's God. Well, then what's your problem? I said, I said Well, uh, you see, we're just getting the people all settled down from last year. We don't want to get that all riled up and stirred up and going again. For my land, these people come back from that tent meeting of yours expecting things out of me I can't do. I said, well, you can't do them anyhow. I can't do them either. Why don't you get out of the way and let God have his way. Let him do it. Oh, and I, to do that, I'd have to get in the closet and seek God. And, uh, and I don't have time to do that. And I've got my schedule and I'm busy. I've got so many activities going. Guess we can't back you this year, Brother Freddy. <laughs> I said, good enough. God will back me like he did last year. Are you happy? Full of power. Full of light. And now... As they were getting ready to stone him, and through the stones, he looked up into heaven and he saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus. He was full of vision. <laughs> oh, don't you want to get full of vision? You want to get a vision that's full, fills you to the overflow, baptized in vision. You believe you could have a vision baptism? So I said, Well, I see a few things every once in a while, Brother Freddie. But mostly I just see through a glass darkly. Why don't you get baptized in vision? Get rid of that crossed vision and get a vision of the cross. Why don't you get Pentecost at any cost instead of being so plenty crossed? <laughs> say hallelujah. So I say, are you talking about denomination? I'm not even mentioning denomination. Pentecost is an experience from God. Healing is an experience from God. Salvation is an experience from God. Oh, speaking in tongues is an experience. Sanctification is an experience. Anything you get from God is an experience. Not a denomination. The reason we have denominations is because so many people got the same experience. They got together and organized it. I'm not against organization because I know so many folks that are so scatterbrained, they need to be organized. But it's just horrible to organize on nothing. That gives you another social club or a social welfare agency to pay the dues of. If you're going to organize, I have an experience. Number one, have an experience from God. That's basic criteria and foundationary necessity. An experience. How many got an experience? A man of an experience has more than a man of an argument. You can argue till you're blue in the face and just huff and puff and debate and split hairs and doctrinally debate and everything else and score points about who's getting ahead and who's winning. But if you get an experience, you know that 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 you know and nobody can talk you out of what you know because you've experienced it and it's happened to you. There's some people you could never talk Bible with them, but all you can do is just give them your testimony. What happened to you? All I can say, sir, whereas I was blind, now I do see. That's all I can say, sir. Say hallelujah. Oh, aren't you glad tonight for the reality of Jesus? Blessed be God. Yes, he looks up and he's so full of vision. You get baptized in vision, you won't be so spiritually blind. You'll know what's going on around you. As someone said, he saw God. No, he didn't see God. He saw the glory of God. Jesus taught so many times, no man have ever seen the Father. The only begotten Son, he hath declared him. Amen. He that's born of God, he hath declared him to be. For how could you see a spirit that is invisible that fills the universe? You might see his manifestation. You might see glory. You might see a pillar of cloud. You might see a pillar of fire. You might see a manifestation. You might see a demonstration, something materialized. But as far as the body of God, as we know bodies, how many knows what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a body? That's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who was the fullness of the Godhead 
bodily, the image of the great invisible God. Hallelujah. And by that same Godhead, which is one body and one spirit, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, above all, through all, and in you all. Half of you seek after him and feel after him. You may just find him, though we be not far from any one of you. In him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your prophets have already written. Hallelujah. Are you glad? Oh, praise God. So he sees the glory of God. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So I said, well, what about the right hand of God? How do you get on the right hand of a spirit that fills the universe? Where is his right hand? He's everywhere, so where is his right hand? Throughout the scripture it says that the right hand is the position of power and preeminence. Mouthpiece and spokesman. The word of God. Say amen. And so now he sees the glory of God. And now he sees Jesus standing, not sitting, standing. He could have been sitting. He told you, Laodiceans, if you'd overcome, he'd allow you to sit with him in his throne, even as he also overcame and am sat down with his father in his throne. All heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. But there's a throne in heaven and Christ sits upon it. But today he was not sitting, he was standing to receive the spirit, the soul of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, who had graduated. Not only from a deacon up to a miracle working sign gift power pack ministry, but he was graduating clear to heaven today. He was going on to glory in his great homecoming. Oh, what a graduation because he got so full of everything God had for him, baptized in everything that was sent his way to the overflow. Now he was full of vision. And now and finally he was full of love. For just before he left the body, he cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Lord Jesus, lay not this sin to their charge. It's just a bunch of ignoramuses. And they don't know what they're doing. They think they're doing God a service in all their religiosity and their churchianity. Hallelujah. They've done their duty and done their part by stoning him dead in the head. Hallelujah. Are you listening? Are you really listening? He was filled of love because you can only be baptized in love. It takes a baptism of love to forgive the person that's killing you. Say amen. I used to be in a position in the early days of my preaching like that. It seemed like people just killed me. But I had to get filled of love full enough so I could forgive them for their ridiculous shenanigans and antics and things they did even during the meeting when the real truth of God's word was being declared. Say amen. Are you happy? Well, don't give up and go home because if first you're going to miss your miracle and secondly, I'm all done preaching. Hallelujah. You needed it. That's my excuse for preaching as long as I did. You want to hear my excuse again? You needed it. Hallelujah. How many can say I needed it tonight? God's going to baptize some of you folks tonight, probably for the first time. I, I heard of a fellow get baptized in pickle juice. His face sure showed it, too. Hallelujah. One little boy went out to the barn and said, You poor old mule, you got religion just like Grandpa's got it. Why don't you get rid of religion and get salvation? There's a million religions. Buddha's dead, and Confucius is dead, and Mary Baker Eddy is dead. Shinto and Hindu and Harry Krishna's dead. Mohammed's dead. Brigham Young's dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Hello. Jesus is still alive. <laughs> I said, he's still alive. He's the only instigator of a world religion, if you want to call it that, that lived to tell about it. Came up out of the grave and promised eternal life to everyone that would follow and believe upon him. Hallelujah. It's still alive. You've got the only living religion in the world. You've got Jesus. You've got Christianity. Hallelujah to God. Whoa, blessed be God. It's the truth tonight. And since it's so alive, why don't you just get filled with it? I said, don't be full of baloney. Be filled with everything God has for you. Let's get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The baptism of wisdom. The baptism of faith, the baptism of power, the baptism of light, the baptism of vision, and the baptism of love. 
How many wants to receive these seven baptisms? If you're one of seven deacons that's planning to graduate, not just to do great things for God in this world, but to go on home to glory and get a mansion robe and crown in the sky. I believe God's got a place prepared for me, and if I graduate, I'm going to receive it. Hallelujah. Get out of the third grade and go on to the fourth and to the fifth and to the sixth and overcome your weaknesses and pass your tests and overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil and see what God God has prepared for you in his fullness. Hallelujah. Oh, go ahead. You can never get the fullness until you start moving on up the ladder. Higher heights and deeper depths. So I said, well, I've been in the church for 40 years. Been on this good old way. Been on the way for 40 years. Yes, and in the way for 35. Hallelujah. I said, you got to grow. Move on. Get developing, mature, and be full. Because we've got to graduate, and there's no stopping place in God, and I'm not going to be satisfied till I get through the pearly gates and lock them behind me. Hallelujah. Well, I love him. I'm finished preaching. I already promised that. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith, and I want to pray my first prayer for all souls, every soul. My first prayer is always for souls, if I can help it. I give two altar calls every night. The first one's by invitation. That's this one. And the second one is by invitation. No, that's this one. The second one is by ear. We go and get them by the ear. Hallelujah. Someone said, you won't be popular, preacher. Who cares? Did I ever say I want to be popular? I'll be popular in heaven with the folks that I came and got by the ear. Because they'll finally make it to heaven and just... Uh, enjoy the place and slap me on the back when I get there for having the backbone to come after them. They just needed an extra shove anyway. Say <laughs> amen. Oh, a faint heart never won a soul for God. He that went of souls is wise. And tonight, praying for souls first, I want to pray for every soul in the place that can say, Brother Freddie, I, I don't really feel like I have the fullness of everything God has for me. Feel like I'm hitting on two cylinders, half mast, dragging bottom. Can't seem to make progress. Getting nowhere as fast. Uh, maybe it's because I've not been baptized in what God has to offer me. Whatever it is, stand tonight and be baptized with it. If you need the fullness in your soul, would you stand? You that needs the fullness. You don't have enough. Doesn't seem like you're making any progress. My first prayer is for souls. Be honest. God will fill you with the fullness tonight of whatsoever you need. Whether it be the Holy Ghost or whether it be wisdom. Or whether it be faith and power. Light or vision or love. You can get the fullness of it. Stephen did then he graduated. He went farther in God than he ever was before. You that are at half mast and not satisfied in your soul. Be honest. Who cares who's looking at you? Everybody will see you at the throne of God. To thine own self be true. The hour is coming when the books will be open. Everything you ever did will be written and read. Everything you ever said will be heard again. God's got the greatest recording equipment, video equipment, audio equipment, computer equipment. He's got the greatest he can play it all back for you. And a lot of people have it played back to them while they're a-dying. Because there's no time in the spirit world. In a moment you can see your whole life. There's no time in the spirit world. Neither is there gravity. Neither is there sickness, sorrow, sighing, crying, or dying. Neither is there affliction or pain or sorrow. Hallelujah. Every person that needs your soul filled to the capacity. Rise, I'm praying for souls on my first prayer. Hallelujah. Put your hands up high. We're praying. Lord, in the first altar call tonight, I trust they came along. Cooperatively. Would you now reach down with the mighty hand that you laid across the plain and put it upon their head, mind, life, and soul? Put them under the spout where well, the glory is coming out. Fill them 
their vessel to the brim. God, give them the difference. Make up the lack. Fill up the slack. Baptize them and immerse them and bury them beneath what you want them to have. Oh, hallelujah. God, let their very soul come to life a 100% fructivity. Oh, take away futility. Even now, let them no longer be exasperated and nauseated and tortured and tormented. God, fill them to the overflow. Baptize them. Let them now have their cup and saucer filled. Oh, Jesus, don't let the cup pass from them, but fill the cup to the brim. Don't let it be the cup of the wrath or the indignation of God, but let it be the cup of God's will, filled to the brim, overflowing all the fullness of the will of God, for that's what the cup means. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, not our will, but thine be done. Don't let the cup pass from us until we drink it. God, fill them with it. Let them now sup and drink. Let them now partake and eat. Let them now obtain and participate. Don't let them be a spectator. Let them be a participator tonight. Don't just let them see the kingdom of God. Let them enter into the kingdom of God. For the kingdom of heaven suffer violence and the virus take it by force. From the days of John the Baptist unto now the kingdom of heaven's man preached and every man press off into it. Put your shoulder to the wheel and put forth an effort. Oh, no matter how violent it takes of an effort, enter into God's best until he fills you to capacity and besides also. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. Baptize these people tonight in the Holy Ghost. Glory, God, take control of their whole life, being body, soul, mind, spirit. Take their tongue. Take all of them, every member. Fill them full. Oh, 100%. No, 110%. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. Fill them with wisdom. Don't let them just be wise enough to exist, but wise enough to graduate. Hallelujah. Not just to hold their own, but to go on. Father and God, they don't have to stop. Anything stops or die. God, give them faith, faithfulness, baptism of faith. Let them be faithful. My servant Moses is different than the rest of you characters, said God Almighty. For my servant Moses is faithful in all mine house. Oh, can we be faithful to the house of God? With him it's different because he's faithful. I'll speak to him mouth to mouth, eye to eye, lips to lips, not in dark similitudes and dark sayings. I will speak apparently, not in parables. Hallelujah. Word for word, I'll declare it exactly to Moses because he's faithful. God, fill these people with faithfulness. Baptize them in faith. Hallelujah. So you can talk to them mouth to mouth. Hallelujah. They can hear with the ear what the Spirit would say unto the church. While they're standing, let their soul now be filled with power. Baptize in power. Baptize in light. Baptize in vision. And baptize in love. In fact, if there's anything else that they need, Baptize them in it. Fill them to the fullness with it. Whatever their need might be, baptize them with it until they need no more. Oh, that they long no more. That they're a widow no longer. Destitute, neglected, poor, separated, unprovided for, and out of daily ministration. The ministration of the Spirit no longer affecting them. Oh God, straighten out these widows tonight. And let them be joined unto the Lord and be one spirit. And let them make her be their husband and let them ask and receive seek find knock it shall be open God let them ask largely and fill them largely fill them so largely full that you baptize them to the overflow in everything let them never be a widow again or a widower either although they're in the family let them no longer be separated in Jesus name glory be to God we're praying here hallelujah to God thank you Jesus blessed be God it's done and everyone said it is done Hallelujah to God. Do you feel fullness in your soul? Is it hitting on all eight cylinders now? Do you feel like you're getting back into the place of God where you once was or where you belong or deeper now than you was before? Well, thank God. That's the purpose of the message. Hallelujah to God. Someone said they don't do this like this down at my church. Well, maybe you haven't recognized it yet, but we're not down at your church. 
tonight we're doing it God's way. Let God have his way. Hallelujah. I worship God quietly in the spirit, Brother Freddie. There's a thousand ways to worship God and get out of the rut. Try something new. Don't be the same old you. Some folks need a facelift. Some needs a new approach. You're so predictable. We know what you're going to say before we see you. Every time we meet you, we know what's coming next. Why don't you take a new approach? Like the sound of the breeze in the mulberry trees. Don't come in ahead, head on of the valley of Rephium and hit the Philistines head on. Come in the side door. Come in the back door. Come in over by the trees this time, said God to David. You need a new approach because the devil's laying for you. He knows how you're going to be. You're so predictable. He knows what you're going to say. But if you could take a new approach, you would amaze him. You'd catch him on his blind side. You'd upend him. You'd throw him into cartwheels. You'd win victory over him. Thank God he's a God of variety. And how many wants God to continue to move in a different way every day? Hallelujah. Praise God. Yea, the Lord of hosts tonight is here in the midst, and he is a God of variety, and he doth move differently. He is not in a routine nor in a rut, and he would have a variety of blessings for thee, and he would have thee do things that thou hast not done before, experience new things, and preach new uh, doctrine, and preach and teach and reach new people. He would have thee to reach out unto many and be different than thou was yesterday, and thou shalt convince even the one who is doubting, who will fall down before you and report that God is in you of the truth. Hallelujah. Everybody said thank God. Wonderful Jesus. Praise him and thank him. The first prayer is a mass prayer, and I believe it was a success. Other prayers are going to be prayed, and we're going to go as God leads us. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Stand, sister, God to touch you. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. Are you here tonight for God to heal your body? Yes. You believe He will? I know He will. You have faith? I do not know you, do I? No. We've never met. Never. If I know anything about you, it has to be God. Amen. Oh, glory. We didn't talk before church. No. I didn't pay you nothing to come in here and do this. No. That's the truth. Can't even pay myself. How am I going to pay her? Hallelujah. But you're here to be healed, and that in itself is a revelation. However, God will give you further proof that he's going to heal you. You've been bothered, first of all, through your stomach area and the lower digestive tract. Yes. How long has it been there? About 20 years. 20 years? Yes. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is 20 years too long for God to do anything? Well, you're about to have a new stomach and receive surgery on the old one here tonight. you believe it? Secondly, you have a little haziness and weakness over your eyes, like a light blur comes, and in the lids, like a little scratchy, sandy, gravelly sensation. Take a step of faith. Never once said, praise God. You want it all, or should we stop there? No. Oh, she's a little bit hoggish tonight. Well, a hoggish congregation is a healthy one because if you didn't want it, God wouldn't do it. And you got to really want it. There's a fullness fills in your throat here. Drainage and something like a little lump or something keeps moving as you swallow. 
God's going to take and clear your throat tonight. Do you believe it? Yes. Fourthly, there's a pressure comes into your head. By times, it comes out of your blood pressure. The blood pressure. Aren't you glad God's going to heal it? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Well, the doctors can't heal blood pressure, but Jesus will. There's no cure, they say. But there's a cure here tonight, and his name is... I couldn't heal a fly of a headache. I'm only praying for this woman. If she's healed, and she will be, it will be the Lord's doings and marvelous in our eyes. Hallelujah. I'm happy. How long have you had high blood pressure? About 10 years. 10 years. Follow me. Why do you make her step out by faith and follow you and walk and take a step? It's obedience. Obedience is the key to moving deeper in the Spirit. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Must I fast 40 days, Brother Freddie? Why don't you try obeying God? It's better than sacrifice. Hallelujah. You have something draws in your lower back. In your lower back. Right over the corners here. In particular, it gets a little sore. Yes. Did you know what this was? Do you have any idea what this is? It's a back injury. With your injury, you also injured and strained your kidneys. Your kidneys. God is going to heal the kidneys when he heals your back injury. And you'll cease to have a burning sensation that comes to the bladder. That'll stop. You understand? Uh, yes. All right. Are you ready for God to do it? Yes. Hallelujah to God. I'm going to toss this in. You, don't, you can get by without it, but it's very small, but you might as well have it. It's a little weakness in your wrist, in your right wrist. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> Won't you be glad to have it back? Yes. Keep your hands up. Have I spoke you the truth tonight? Yes, you have. And we don't even know each other. No. We've never spoke. We've never talked. We've never met. Do you believe in the gifts of the Spirit? Nine gifts of the Spirit? Someone said, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit, Brother Freddie. Tongues and interpretation of tongues. My friends, there's seven more than that. And when the other seven start to operate, it does not mean the devil just moved the town. God's got nine gifts, not two. Be thou healed in Jesus' name. She's all right. Don't worry about her. I've seen that 560,000 times. Hallelujah. She's only on the operating table pretty soon. She'll rise and she'll be all right. Thank God. Rise, God will touch you. What do you think about what God did for her? Great. Isn't that great? Yeah. Raise up, your, raise up your hands to the Lord. Will you also be healed tonight? Yes. Yes. Shut your mommy now. The eyes are gay to the soul. You have had like tiredness throughout your body and exhaustion. Your blood is low. To you it's tired blood, but it's actually low blood. Amen. You're borderline anemic. God's going to heal your anemia tonight. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank God. There comes a little lightheaded swimming dizziness in your head. It's going to stop. Thirdly, you have, shall I pray for it all? Amen. Yeah. There's a little crick. Look, look here. little crick in drawing comes in your neck. Back of your neck. Every once in a while, yeah. It's going to go. Everyone said Amen. Hallelujah to God. I love him. There's a very small sinus that plugs and drains to your nasal. Mm -hmm. That's going to be healed. God is not the author of confusion. He would not reveal it unless he meant to heal it. Thank God. One bone in your spine in the vertebrae, lower part of your back. It's a little weak and it goes in and out on the disc. Amen, I guess. <laughs> It's a spot in the spine, a little tender. You do not know if it moves in and out, but it moves out, making it sore, which is what the sore spot is. God is freeing you of this. Thank God. This is your healing. I'm also going to pray for your ministry. You have a ministry. You're a handmaiden of the Lord, and you have a prayer ministry. It's a prayer ministry, and you're going to travail again in prayer, in accessory prayer, intercessory prayer. Amen. God will show you who to pray for. 
and he'll show you by face and by name. Mm -hmm. And Patsy, Patricia, Patsy. You know who that is? I know a few, but I don't know in particular. Yeah, you're going to be praying for them first, okay? Start praying for them first. That's just a little sign. If you didn't know it, it'd be off the wall. But you know them. God wants you to start your new prayer ministry of intercession by praying for them. Go to God. Someone said, praise the Lord. Be thou healed. Jesus name. Everyone said it's done. Blood transfusion, anemia is gone. Hallelujah to God. Dizziness has left the head. Even now it's gone instead. Sinus is open. It moved. Breathe through there. Hallelujah. Is it clear? Amen. Well, praise God. I can't seem to get her attention. She'll be back in a minute. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Take one step of faith with me. Move your neck and see if there's a crick. No. <laughs> well, the way you put those that neck to those calisthenics, if there was one there, you'd have found it. Now, there is, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's just a, like a little warmth, a little warm heat came upon you. Amen. Especially when you said about my sinuses, because I always um, breathe through my mouth and sit up through my nose. Now you breathe through your nose. Of course. <laughs> but that's when the blood was here. The warm heat, I must tell the congregation, when the warm heat passes through the body in our ministry, it's a sign of a blood transfusion. That was actually, technically, when your blood was healed. Amen. Thank you. You believe God's healed your anemia? Amen. Amen. God is going to, even now, help you with intercession. Let it be done. Someone said, thank God. Hallelujah. I'm happy. Everyone said, I am happy. Glory to God. Stand, God will touch you then. You have a little... Little eye strain and burning comes to your eyes? Yes, sir, it sure did. A blur accompanies it? Yes, sir, it is. 2020, receive it. In Jesus' name. I didn't get to pray for everything. He left us suddenly. Hallelujah. However, well, it didn't take long in the recovery room, did it? Walk back down here just a minute and look out across the congregation. Praise God. Are there any brighter or clearer or plainer or crisper to the eyes? Amen. Hallelujah. I have blurred vision at close range. Hallelujah. Thank God I know I'm healed. Hallelujah. Praise Amen. the Lord. You're, it's really happening? Amen. Amen. Now, how could that have possibly happened? Is it possible anything like that could happen in this day and age? When Jesus said, get out, do greater works than he did. Lord of mercy, we had him scratch the surface of the works he did. Before you go, put your hands back. I want to pray for everything. You have a little tightness in your chest in the breathing. Yes, sir. It's respiratory and it's healed. Now, it is also hereditary in your family that people in your family get blood pressure, high blood pressure. Yes, sir. You have a little bit of it yourself. Hmm? Yes, sir. Down. Your breathing's up. You have a little stoppage will try to crawl into your hearing and a noise goes through your head. The noise is kind of like a buzzing or a little roaring. Is that so? Yes, sir. It's now quiet. Thank God it is done. Everyone said it is. All glory. Sister in the sling. Come next. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. We don't care if you get a tumor as big as a tub. We'll tackle anything around here. Journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. How'd you bust your arm up? I hung my foot in the telephone cord and fell down. What? <laughs> oh, now the truth's coming out. I cracked my, the ball joint. 
It is. Yes, sir. And how did you do that again? With the telephone? I hung my foot in the telephone cord and fell down. Well, let's hang the devil that pulled the trick on you. <laughs> Raise your good arm to God. Let's get ready to pray. Hallelujah. Hold that. You believe God's going to heal this? Yes, sir. Will you know when it's healed? Yes, sir. All your suffering will leave it, and you'll be able to use it, won't you? Yes. Then get ready to know it, because it's leaving now. Some said, I wouldn't be too sure, Brother Freddie. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure. Loosen, grab it tonight, restore her. Let this arm be knit, the bone be joined, the marrow come together, the fracture leave, the crack subside. Let even now, rapidly, miraculously, the calcium come together, just like Jesus would do. It was the least he could do or would do for Grammy. Heal her broken arm if he was here tonight. Just think if Jesus was only here tonight. Huh? You don't believe Jesus is here tonight. No, you don't. Some of you don't believe this arm's healed. If Jesus was here tonight, what, what would he do to this arm? Don't you wish he just somehow could show up? He is? And what makes you think that he wouldn't be everywhere by his spirit doing the same thing? That's why he went to heaven and sent the Holy Ghost. So he could be everywhere at the same time. Well, grab your star. Thank you, You believe it's done? Yes, sir. Take that thing off, then. It's the sense of being all wrapped up in bondage. I mean, bandage. 